Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is getting crazy. I keep getting off this. All right, about 30 seconds. And we will be getting started. Hebrews 11. Bible study. What up, what up? Bada bing, bada boom. All right, give me one second. Boom. Bada boom. What up, what up? Hope everybody is uh, doing well. Hope all is well in the universes. Today we are going through or continuing to go through Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we, we didn't get to uh, finish it last week. I'm not even sure if we'll be able to finish the uh, rest of it this week. I think it's just a, let me say heavy chapter. I mean, all of it has been, but I think I just want to go a little slower and think this, but we, we might be able to uh, finish the rest of this. But yeah. Hope everybody's doing well. I got a, I ain't gonna lie, I got a bit of a bl the blues. Uh, part of it is I got um my uh, I got ADHD. So sometimes my ADHD medicine gives me the blues at the end of the day. So part of it is that, but then also I, I think we'll talk about it Thursday on the podcast. Thursday on the podcast, talking about the blues, talking about some some wild stuff. But uh, hopefully encouraging, we'll see. But uh, but yeah, but today we will continue through Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see where we left off. We left off around verse 6. Uh, again, definitely now as we get into this super familiar Part. And what I mean by familiar is like if you grew up in church long enough, you've heard Hebrews chapter 11. You've heard these scriptures on faith. But the unfortunate thing is most likely, uh, I think most of us have not heard it in, in, in proper relationship with the rest of the book of Hebrews because that changes how you how you see those scriptures uh completely I'm trying to I don't like making like absolute statements but it, I mean it, it it does when you when you see these things about faith and again we we talked about this a little bit last week we have a video on it on the channel about what is faith. Faith is faithfulness. Faith is not just I believe. Faith is a commitment to what I believe. Um, Dr. Mike Heiser calls it a believing loyalty. Uh, it is a belief that provokes you to commitment. It's like, I believe, therefore I am committed. And so... When, when you read Hebrews outside of, again, the relationship, when you, he, when you read Hebrews 11 outside of the relationship with the rest of the book of Hebrews, you can kind of get this really one-sided view of, of Hebrews 11 and all the scriptures that you see about faith. You can see it as, okay, yeah, they just had to believe to get the things that they want, and then I have to believe to get the things that that I want. And um yeah, that's not that's not what he said. And uh when we go through it, I would I would encourage you just to remember everything uh if you've been following the Bible studies, everything that we've talked about thus far, right? All those things that we talked about thus far 
Why is he writing this? Who is he writing it to? What are they facing? What is he trying to convince them of? And what has he been challenging them to commit to? And so here, as we get to, we, we finished 10, we started 11 last week. Excuse me. We see that these are people who, as Jesus talked about in the parable, who started off strong, who started off um, faithful and committed. I want to. I want to see if I can find the scripture real quick. Uh, I was joking with a friend of mine, shout Pastor Rodney. He got a great podcast, the Beautiful Breakdown. I was joking with him. I mean, I said this last week, like he's one of those people who can just remember the chapter, verse, paragraph line. I just remember the uh, the book. And sometimes not even that. Definitely if, definitely if it's in two books. I want to get to the parable of the uh, sower. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, let's read this in. Matthew 13, because I think this, um, does a couple of things. I think it kind of lays a good idea of what they were probably struggling with in Hebrews. And I, I hope that it will allow us to see ourselves too, and kind of be, uh, warned by it. This is Jesus when he's talking about the parable of the sower. Do, 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 do. All right, let's look at this in do, 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 do. Um, All right, let's, let's start at verse three, Matthew 13, verse three. And he spoke many things to them in a parable saying, behold, the sower went out to sow, and while he was sowing, some seed fell on the side of the path, and the birds came and devoured it. The other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up at once because it did not have any depth of soil. But when the sun arose, it was scorched, and because it did not have enough root, it withered. And other seed fell among the thorn plants, and the thorn plants came and choked it. But other seed fell on good ground and produced grain. This a hundred times as much as, sorry, this one, what? This one a hundred times as much as, what is going on? Sorry, my uh, brain's everywhere. I'm like, yeah, anyway. This one a hundred times as much, as much, and this one sixty, or, and this I'm sorry, and this one sixty, and this one thirty. Oh, oh my goodness, reading is fundamental. Um, let the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then scroll down because the reason for the parable, and then his um, I don't know if it's, it's in this book or maybe another one. Basically, his disciples come to him and was like, "What are you talking about?" And so he explains the. Parable. I want to go down to where he explains it. Um, therefore, you listen. Therefore, listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, snatches away the word sown in his heart. This is what, this is what was sown on the side of the path. And verse twenty. And what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but does not have root, does not have a root in itself, but lastly only, a, but lasts only a little while. And when affliction and persecution happens because of the word, immediately he falls away. And I think this kind of, when, when we talk about Hebrews chapter 11 and, um, or the book of Hebrews in general, and what they were going through, this kind of seems to me 
at least similar, where definitely verse 10, he talks about how they, when they received the word, they received it with such joy and even the initial persecution that they went through, they endured because they were more grateful for what they would possess eternally. And this, this is going to be an important point. They were more grateful for what they would possess eternally than any temporary thing that they lost here on earth. And it, it seems as though from his writing that through the course of time and maybe some unmet expectation of what they thought would happen or just continuous persecution, they find themselves now, as Jesus says, here falling away from the word because of affliction, because of persecution. It's interesting, and this is why I enjoy, one of the reasons why I enjoy doing stuff like this so much is because kind of the, the prescription that Jesus gives is having strong roots. And being rooted, you know, I, I, I hear he says, but he does not have a root in himself. And so we talk about this all the time. We definitely will be talking about it on Thursday on the podcast about like this idea of have not having a relationship and really not being so dependent upon, okay, this is what somebody else told me about God. Like so many people are waiting for God to do something that a man promised them. Like, you know, whatever. And I'm sure, you know, I'm trying to be courteous, but like I can get on here and I can say, oh, God told me that tomorrow all this time, whatever you're going through was going to be over and you're going to get double whatever. And you could be really going through. Tomorrow comes and you're still going through. And let's say you really, really believe that. You're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is amazing. And then tomorrow comes really going through. I'm I'm, I'm at home chilling. And it's, it's weird. It feels like typically when stuff like that happens, people are like, oh, why God? I thought I was supposed to get my breakthrough. God's like, I ain't say that. The internet did. So I think like this, this, point of he does uh 21 uh where are we at 13 21 but he does not have a root in himself but lasts only a little while and when affliction comes because somebody else's and, and i think we know this from life somebody else's word somebody else's message is not going to ground you like you have to be rooted you have to have a root of the kingdom within yourself. And when we go back to Hebrews, and I don't I don't want to trivialize this because you know we don't know the the persecution that they were going through. Like they were really going through. So I you know I'm not pretending like, oh yeah, that was me. I would just read my Bible. Like, no, I mean I, you know. I'm I'm you know I'm part of the generation of spoiled and comfortable and and coddled Christians. So, I mean, the level of, of uh, persecution and the level of loss that they were suffering for the name of Jesus, for the gospel, I, you know, I can't even imagine. And so, but <sighs> what the writer of Hebrews is challenging them to do is to, to is to, remain committed it's to remain committed and he and he's about to go give list these examples and when we go through these examples i want you to really think about this because this this is what i mean by when we look at hebrews it is often removed from when we look at hebrews 11 it is often removed from its relationship with the rest of the scripture with the rest of the book of Hebrews. And when that happens, that changes how you interpret and see what you're reading, right? So when we go through these 
kind of people of faith, depending on, you know, what church and what message you heard. It could be like, yeah, Abraham believed God and then he got the things that he wanted. And uh, that is the opposite of what of what uh, Hebrews is, is actually saying. And uh, we'll read it here and see. And, re- you know, just remember the context of, of the, the of, of everything we've read so far and what he's challenging them to do. And it's heavy. It's heavy. It's, it's, it's deep in it, and it is, it is challenging. But at least it's, it is, it, and I don't know if this makes sense, but at least it's true. Like, I feel like we, even if I'm not at the bar yet, even if I'm not there, at least give me a true marker to shoot for. Don't, you know. Allow me to be deceived. So anyway, let's let's look at this. We're going to start at verse 5. Um, it says, by faith, Enoch. Come on, somebody. I was just listening to the book Enoch uh, earlier. Very interesting. Very interesting book. So that he did not uh, experience death, and he was not found because God took him up. Before his removal, he had been approved as as having plead, as sorry, as having been pleasing to God. Now, without faith or faithfulness, as we talked about before, this is going to be super important. Without faithfulness, it is impossible to please him. For the one who approaches him must believe that he exists and that and is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then let's go on. By faith, Noah, being warned about things not yet seen, out of reverence, constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family by which he pronounced sentence on the world and became heir became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith or faithfulness by faith abraham when he was called obeyed uh when he was called obeyed to go out to a place that he, that he was going to receive for an inheritance and when he went out and he went out not knowing where he was going. So Abraham, I just, uh, like, come on. I met, like, Abraham has no idea where he is going. And he has to take his whole family and uproot because of a promise that God gave him. And it's like, Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it, to me, it's wild. It ain't like you just get a hotel and be like, all right, we're going to get it. Like, yeah, to take your whole family, leave from the comfort, the protection, the covering of someone else, and to take your whole family and just go to a land because God told you that he's going to give it to you and your your uh, descendants is, 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 is just wild. Uh, verse 9, by faith, he lived in a land of promise as a stranger living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was expecting the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Hebrews 11, 11. By faith also, Sarah, but I'm sorry, by faith also with Sarah, he conceived the ability to procreate even past the normal age because he regarded the one who promised to be faithful. Again, faith faith is a co- is a commitment. Be is a commit faith is a commitment to faithfulness to one already deemed faithful. So it's like I trust you, therefore I am committed to you. Again, this is not like some I trust you, I believe until I get uncomfortable. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is is challenging them on. Like, it's like, no, I trust you, and therefore I am committed to you. All right? Um, Whoever God has his own body, we have problems. Uh, Verse 12, he says, therefore these, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 12, therefore these were fathered from one man and him being as good as dead as the stars of the heavens in the in number and like the innumerable sand 
by the sea by the shore of the sea. She shall shells by the seashore. She shall shells by the seashore. Say that. I um I'm gonna keep going on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is the 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 uh the verse I want to get to. Let me read that again. I messed myself up doing my little poem. It says verse twelve, and therefore these were fathered from one man, and being as good as dead, and he being as good as dead as the stars of heaven in number like the innumerable sand by the shore of the sea. These all died in faithfulness without this, read this again. These all died in faith without receiving the promises. I'm going to read it one more time. These all died in faith or faithfulness without receiving the promises. But seeing them from a distance and welcoming them and admitting that they were strangers and temporary residents on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they remember that the land from which they went out, sorry, and if they remember the land from which they went out, then they would have not had the opportunity to return. But not aspiring, but now they aspire to a better land that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is deep because, again, we, we go back to why he's writing this, that he, say, he says here in verse, uh, da, 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 da. these all died without receiving the promise. For if they had remembered the land, from which they went out, they would have not had the opportunity to return. So like if they would have remembered or sought to go back to what God had brought them from and not pursue the promises, they, they wouldn't have had the ability to return. I think about like, um, you know, earlier we talked about that these were people who who the writer's writing to, who endured great suffering, who endured great sorrow, but now are really struggling. And it seems like they are looking to return back to this method of the law and, and, and uh, self-righteousness and their works to, to trust in that as the thing that can make them right before God as they endured numerous persecutions. And again, he is encouraging them to faithfulness, to a commitment. And he gives the example of all these people, including Abraham, who he says, again, 13, these all died in faith or faithfulness without receiving the promise. Having seen them from a distance and welcoming, welcoming them and admitting that they were strangers and temporary residents in earth. Abraham did not necessarily live to see his seed become like the sands of the seashore. You know what I mean? Like Abraham saw, received Isaac, and he saw that miracle of Isaac, and he saw the blessing of Isaac, but he did not see the generations and generations that God had promised them once he left his father's once he left his father's land. Abraham did not, he didn't see it. But that's the thing. He he was not, and this is the this is the challenge to me. And I think the challenge that we have to ask ourselves is is this home? Because like for Abraham, for Noah, for these people, this wasn't home. 
So what I, what happened to me and what I temporarily receive here and what I endure here is not what is permanent. The writer of Hebrews says that they saw themselves as strangers in a foreign land. And so when we think about the people here who he's writing to who are being persecuted, who are going through tremendous difficulty, probably genuine difficulty. Like I said, things I probably can't even uh, think about. But he's encouraging them not, not know this is your season, it's going to work out tomorrow. He's saying to them, this is not your home. This is not your home. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I think that's something that we don't really talk about and think about as much as believers. I mean, I, I've heard it sometimes, like, we'll say this is not your home when sometimes when it comes to behavior and it's like when we're trying to, uh, you know, highlight the difference in how a believer should act and how someone who's not a believer should act. And I think that's great. But I think also in our dependency in complete fulfillment and restoration in a place that is not our home. I think it's wrong. Not to like challenge myself. Like I said, I was I was listening to uh, the, the 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 book of Enoch, and you know I I I, I, I still don't have a strong opinion on. I am curious why it's not in the Bible. I always bring that up, but I like I'm not like oh the book of Enoch is whatever inspired. Uh, I don't know. I'm just listening to it, going through it. Um, but one of the things it did do, just because it talks a lot about um, having Enoch is kind of being, for lack of better words, toured around by an angel, and he's seeing all sorts of things. And then just hearing the uh, description of, of various things, it did just remind me, like, yeah, this place is not our home. Like whatever temporary suffering we endure here is like, it's just that it, it, it is temporary. There is a, there is a realer place. There is a, there is a realer, uh, you know, that sounds like bad English, a realer. There's a, there's a real lure home. And, uh, I have to challenge myself and say, am I so married here? I think about, um, use this example a lot, fantastic fire movie. Uh, if you ain't seen it, you're missing out. Um, what's that movie? Hook. Come on, somebody. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Hook uh, where, with um, Robin, Robin Williams. Rest in peace, Robin Williams. But, it, I mean, it was a great movie, and, you know, I'm a – spoil it even though you know if you ain't seen any of this stuff but anyway the premise of the movie is like a kind of uh remake or kind of twist on the peter pan story and it's basically peter pan has grew up like he came here visiting wendy and in the process of visiting wendy he never really went back home he just stayed here and he kind of got a job and in the process of all that he forgot who he was and then Hook comes, take his kid, and then he has to go back to Neverland and have to remember. Remember who you are, Peter. Oh, Peter, you're doing it. So, uh, so that's the the thing of Hook. But the thing that 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 reminds me of is like, I think that's kind of like us. Just like Peter kind of came, was visiting Wendy, and he was really he was supposed to be bringing Wendy to where he is. But when he came here to visit Wendy. He got comfortable. He fell in love with, with, I think, Wendy's daughter. And before you know it, he forgot that this wasn't his home. And he just got so, you know, comfortable. And in, in the beginning of the movie, Peter Pan, who said, I'll never grow up, is like this grumpy old dad. And I think sometimes that's kind of us as believers. We're like 
trying, we're supposed to be a light, we're supposed to be bringing people to where we are, we're supposed to be bringing people hope, but we kind of spend all our time, you know, we, in the process of spending time here, we kind of fell in love with here. And we have forgot that this is not our home. And our joy and our happiness and everything depends on what happens to us here. I mean, one of the things I was just thinking about today, I don't know, but I was thinking about today, um, a lot of times people talk about like suffering, like, you know, how can God allow suffering and such, you know, bad things to happen? And, you know, it's always, a, you know, people have their different views or whatever on it. And we've talked about it here before. But something else that comes to mind is I just think, like, it it, it, it really could be just a thing of perspective. Like, anyone who is in heaven eternally with God the Father, I, I don't think they feel cheated. I don't think they feel slighted. I I mean, just imagine you are mad at God because someone you love is no longer here. And you're like, God, this is not fair. How dare you? And then they are in the presence of God, chilling, completely at peace, completely happy, healthy, um, and, and, and yeah, and, and, and not regretting it. And we're here just like, God, oh, why? And it's, yeah, I, you, I said this before, it always is just, it was, I, when my, my dad passed away, uh, about a year and a half ago now, um, January, uh, oh, February of last year. And he was in the hospice and I remember, yeah, he was in the hospice and I had talked to him before he got really sick and then he had gotten like super sick and I, I hadn't talked to him and I wasn't sure that I would be able to talk to him. Actually, I talked to him one time when he was super sick, he was like super out of it. And it was just weird and um, kind of sad. And I thought, man, that'll be the last time that I talked to him. But um, anyway, long story short, I was able to talk to him one more, one more time. And he kind of like, it was like one of those calls, basically like, uh, say your goodbyes. And um, it's just weird because it's like, you don't want to hang up. Because the hang up is to be like, that, that's it. Like, this is literally like, you know, I'm trying to think through, you know what I mean? Like, is there anything I want to say that I, you know, said and X, Y, Z. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's just weird. I don't know. If, I mean, people probably would, maybe I'm weird. That I think it's weird, but it's just weird because, like I said, you don't want to hang up. You don't know what to say. But also, you know, you can't stay there. And it's just like, you know, when you say bye, that's bye. And, um, yeah, I remember one of the last things that my dad said to me was, uh, I'll see you later. And I, he, he, I forgot how he said it, but it was just basic. Like, the way he said it was just like, if, it just freaked me out because it's like, I knew that he knew that, that he knew that he would see me again. And I know that I would see him him again. And it really was just like, I will see you later. And um, a couple of days later, he, uh, he left, he transitioned. And so it's like, I don't think that he is, you know, whether you could go to heaven immediately. I don't know how all that stuff works. People like to debate that. Um, but, I, you know, I don't think that he is... Uh, arguing with God, like, God, why you got me up here? No, I think he, you know, I, I, I think he is, he is good. And so anyway, just going through here in Hebrews, it's just reminding me and challenging me that like, this earth is not our home. Like we have made this place our home. We've invested 
so much into it. And some of that's good, some of that's bad, but like, we, you know what I mean? Like, like, think about it. We say that we believe scripture, we say that we believe these things, but when it comes to scriptures like this, how much do we internalize it? How much do we really see ourselves as strangers and temporary residences on earth? And so that the sufferings or whatever we endure, even though God has been tremendously good to us, I mean, He's always, I mean, He's good to everyone. But you know, what I mean, like, come on, man, if you if you watching this, God has been good to you. I mean, I don't, I don't know the expectation that we have from God is just weird that we would never go through anything, that we would never go through sorrow, that we would never go through pain, or that we would be able to pick the type of pain we get. No, listen, you can't, you, you, you can't, you can't pick the type of pain, sorrow, and really even joy you get. I mean, it is, it is all the grace and mercy in God. We, you know, put our lives before him. We pray, we ask, we make our petitions and he does what he wants. And, um, in those moments of disappointment, in those moments of sorrow, I think we just got to remember that this earth is, uh, not a home. This, uh, let me, uh, continue on and we'll wrap up here. And it says, but they aspire to be better, that is, they aspire to a better land, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Come on. And, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll keep on. Uh, by faith or faithfulness, when a Abram, when he was tested, offered Isaac, the one who received, and Isaac, oh, excuse me, I don't know what's going on. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac, and the one who received the promises was ready to offer his one and only son with reverence to whom it is said, in Isaac your descendants will be named. Having reason, that God was able to raise him from the dead from which he received him back as a symbol. By faith also Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things that were going to happen. So by faith and faithfulness, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things that were going to happen by faith or faithfulness. Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on top of his staffs. And, and so this is important because the, these, you know, it sounds like Jacob was dying. And he blessed Joseph and, 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 and walked in faithfulness to a promise that he would never see. Joseph, when he, he was dying, told them, and he, and he mentions it here by faith, as he was dying, uh, by faith, Joseph, as he was dying, mentioned about the excess of the children of Israel and gave them instructions about his bones. Come on, like, he's, he's dying, and the, the children of Israel, I mean, they weren't even in, really in bondage yet. Yeah, I, they weren't, weren't in bondage yet. And by faith, he tells the children of Israel, because of the promise that God made to Abraham, that we're going to have our own land, and when we go, take my bones with you. And he did not receive... He didn't see that thing, that thing that he was believing for. He did not see and experience it himself, but he died in faithful commitment to God and faithful commitment to the promise. And so what the writer of Hebrews is challenging his audience to do is to remain faithfully committed, regardless of what you're enduring. That this is not like 
this is not like a temporary thing. Like, and and again, I think this is why a definition on perspective on faith is so important because if faith is just believing, like I believe that this thing I want to happen will happen, and therefore because I believe it, it will happen. Or it will always happen, just as just as I believe it. It's like, no, like faith. Faith is a faithful commitment. Like I am, I am committed. So again, Joseph, even though he would not see it for himself, he faithfully instructed them to carry his bones for a promise that he would not be able to experience by faith. Uh, continue on. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was handsome and they were afraid of the edict of the king. By faithful faithfulness, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing instead to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to experience the transitory enjoyment of sin considering reproach endured for the sake of Christ now uh, I was trying to see if I could hit this note yeah I mean I, I think it's interesting yeah I mean the, the writer Hebrews is, is, is so interesting because he is uh you could tell he's he's bringing these examples to prove a point in the a current moment. This is why with Moses, he mentions um, even Christ. So it's like Moses says faithfulness wasn't a, it wasn't a negotiation tactic to get what he wants. So like right now, I think sometimes as believers, we treat obedience and we treat faith like they are sometimes, and I think it's even taught, unfortunately, um, some places they're like, this is like some way to manipulate God into getting you whatever you want. It's like, if you obey and you believe, then God is somehow obligated to give to give you whatever you want. No, I, no, I, I think, and this is why going through Hebrews 11 in the context of, of the rest of Hebrews is so important because the point that he's making is that you have received the promise. You received the promise. This is the, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the work of the redemption of your sins, the, the cost of your foolishness. You understand? Like, it's it's just interesting and wild. Like, God is like, Jesus has made a way, redeemed us of our sins. You would think now is our time to respond. Now is our time to be faithful. Now is our time to act. But we're like, all right, cool. That was great. Now, what else you got? What's the next? Let me get this job. Let me get this. Let me get that. It's like, no, what is my faithful commitment to the work that he has already accomplished for me? And he's given the example of all these people who, had, who did not see the things that they were believing for. Who, who did not see it, who who were faithfully committed regardless of whether or not it happened in their lifetime. Like, and that's not a, that's not a easy thing. I'm not even trying to suggest it. Like, this is just something like, oh yeah, you just got to buck up. No, but I think this is why these things are worth emphasizing. This is why these things are worth focusing on because like there's this deep heavy work that we're not even not only are we not doing we're not even talking about we're not even preparing it's like yo we're called to faithfulness regardless 
of if we see the full fruit of it here, we're still called to faithfulness. What is that? What does that look like in the face of disappointment? Uh, in their case, in the face of uh, persecution, in the face of trouble, what does it look like to remain faithful? Again, the writer of Hebrews is not given some formula of how to get what you want from God. He's walking through. I'll need to. I'll need to be obligated to God to be faithful to God because of what He's already done for us. And so, let's uh, go on. Choose to be mistreated. Christ will treasure by faith. He left Egypt, not fearing the anger of the king, for he persevered as if he saw the invisible one. By faith, he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, in order that the one who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith, for faith in this, they crossed the they crossed the Red Sea as in dry ground. The Egyptians were made. The Egyptians, when they made the attempt, were drowned. By faith, or faith in this, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had marched around for seven days. By faith, or faith in this, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she uh, welcomed the spies into the into peace. What more should I say? 32, this, this one is very important. 32, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to, to tell about Gideon. Barak is interesting because he didn't really he didn't do nothing, but maybe they, they got some stories about him. I didn't know about uh, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith or faithfulness conquered kingdoms, uh, accomplished judgments, obtained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, uh, extinguished the effectiveness of fires, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong from from weakness, became mighty in battle, put to flight, uh, put to flight enemy battle lines. Women received back their dead by resurrection, but others. I love this balance. I, don't, well, I, don't, I mean, it's it's a weird part to say I love something, but you know what I mean. Like there is. There is truth in that if you want to receive anything from God, it does require faith and endurance. And it doesn't mean that you won't receive anything. It doesn't mean that every promise is not one that is here. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that we should believe God for. But I think one of the things that Hebrews is pointing out is that it shouldn't always just be pointed in that direction. Just the, the things that I can receive now. Because here he goes on and he talks about all these great things that they did, right? Who through faith conquered kingdoms. They accomplished judgments. They obtained what was promised. They got it. Shut the mouths of lions. Extinguish the effectiveness of fires. Escape the edge of the sword. Made strong from weakness. Mighty in battle. Put the flight. Uh, enemy battle lines, women receive back their dead by resurrection, but others were tortured, not accepting release in order that they might gain a better resurrection. This is like the part of the balance that we don't talk about, that everybody's story does not, or not even everybody's story, every situation in your life won't always end up rosy. Women receive back their, uh, their dead by resurrection, but others were tortured, not accepting release in order that they might gain a better resurrection. And others experienced mocking and flogging, and in addition, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were murdered by the sword, 
They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, impoverished, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about on deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, although they were all approved through their faith or faithfulness, they did not receive what was promised because God had something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Here is, I think, one of the kind of, I'm not going to say dangerous, but one of the things that I think we don't consider when we read scripture sometimes is like, or when we teach it, it's like we always tell everybody that they're David, you know, fighting their Goliath, they're uh, Moses going against their Pharaoh, they're Elijah going against their Jezebel. Here, the writer of Hebrews has a whole, he goes through a list of story stories of people who were approved by God whose stories don't end up like that. But others, tortured, not accepting release in order that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mocking and flogging, in addition, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they died by murder with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, goat, and goatskin, impoverished, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains, in caves, and in holes in the ground. Like, there's no book of the Bible about these people, but they were accepted, they were approved. But they were also went through. <laughs> they went through. And although they were all approved through their faithfulness, they did not receive what was promised. Again, you, we, we talked about like um we look at Abraham and he didn't really fully receive what was promised, right? He he got Isaac, but he did not see his seed become like the sands or the seashore. He he did, he didn't see that. We talked about uh Joseph who he did not see the promise even going back to the promise that was given to Abraham, he did not see the promise of the children of Israel having their own land. When he died, they were in Egypt. But by faithfulness, he, he, he told them and gave them instructions on what to do when they left to carry his bones. And so you have these people who have received like these promises here on earth who have done these great things, but then there's still these things that, you know, they would not receive in their lifetime. And then, you again, you go down, and then you have this other group of people who are just, who have suffered tremendous things. Tremendous things. Like, man, you, we're, I'm not going to say we're chilling, but, I mean, if we're able to watch this, we're, we're at a, a lot better place. We're at a better place than a lot of people. I mean, you go over to, you know, Gaza and all the other things that happen in the world. I mean, people are dealing with, it's it, it's insane to me the contrast of like life. Like right now, me and you, we're here wherever we are. And then at the same moment, this exact moment, um, you know, thousands of miles away, maybe not even thousands of miles away in some cases. You know, people are living in some of the worst, tragic situations that we couldn't even imagine. And some of these people are believers. And it's like, it's just... And this is the this is why Hebrews is... And this is why, anyway, going through the, the Bible is so 
important because it, it doesn't lie to you. Like I always say, like God ain't lie to you. Preachers lie to you. Like it it lets you know that you like, like you listen, there will be suffering. You will you will suffer. And not only will you suffer, will you remain faithful in disappointment? Will you remain committed in some of the hardest times of your life? Yeah, and it's and and, and it yeah. And it challenges us to do that. One of the things that I want to work on is I, I just want to be faithful. And I know for me, I have a uh, very, uh, what is the word? All or nothing personality. Go for broke. I'm like, bet it all. Why do... 10%, 50% when you could do a thousand percent. And, uh, you know, sometimes that has its advantages. But one of the things that I have to be mindful of is that that really doesn't require faithfulness. Some people may say, I mean, it could require boldness. It could require trust. It could require belief. And in some instances, yes, it could require faithfulness. But like, when you go all out, you kind of go all out, right? So you, you kind of gave everything at once. But the, the the thing that is difficult for me is the 1% or 10% every day, whatever. It does it, Well, you don't go all out, but you just stay committed to this thing and, and you don't change it. Like if I say, um, whatever, I've been trying to get in shape for, come on now, forever. I'll be like, all right, I'm going to go to the gym. And then I, I'm going to try to do all this. I'm going to go to the gym for two hours. Now, I've been in the gym in what, ridiculous long. But the, the first day, I'm like, I'm going to go for two hours. I'm going to go for three hours. Versus, why don't you just go 30 minutes every time? Why don't you go 15 minutes and then work your way up to 30 minutes? It's like, nah, you got to go all out. And I say that because one of the things I want to work on for God is faithfulness. Like what does it look like for us to be faithful believers in the small things? Of course we can do the dramatic, the all out things, but like what am I faithfully doing that is for God? Like this is just for God. I'm just putting money aside just so I can have it to give to someone in need for God because he's called me to be a light. I am faithfully getting up praying for this person every day without them knowing uh, because it is my offering to God in faithfulness. It's like, what does faithfulness look like from us as believers out of gratitude for the work that he has done on the cross? And I think, um, yeah, that's one. I, I would uh, just challenge us to think about that. One of the things that I am uh, challenging myself to look at and to think about what does remain, what it, what does it mean to be faithfully committed to the work of Christ. But that is it. Uh, next week, I mean, I guess we did get through all of Hebrews. Next week, we will be. Come on. And again, I hope you all have been following this because then you see the consistent theme. You see that there's a consistent theme to these scriptures that sometimes we get in, in, in pieces. Like it's a consistent theme that he's saying from what he started with even in uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And so, yeah, next next week we'll, we'll be at chapter 12. And I would just encourage us to remain faithfully committed to the work that God has called us to do. Be faithful to the one who's been faithful to us. We'll be back Thursday. I, I started this uh, podcast by saying I had the blues. I mean, I started Bible study by saying we had the blues. I'm talking about it on Thursday. But it does have to do with this little, not a little, but this uh, conference thing. Um, I mean, if you've, I don't know, if you've been a 
Mm-hmm. But you might hear like Mark Driscoll was at this conference and they had this guy who was doing this acrobatic thing. And they temporarily uh, kick, uh, kick Mark Driscoll. I, I've got a lot of thoughts on it, but you know, I I don't know. I'm talking about it on Thursday. I want to uh, kind of think through and not be rash. And um, yeah, but we'll be talking about that and which this is attached to is how as believers we can we cannot we cannot get into this tribalism mindset like the scripture we talked about earlier we just said that uh I actually still got it here read this real quick and he said in verse 1321 but he does not have a root in himself. And that's the thing. I think as believers, we don't have a foundation, a root in ourselves. So when affliction, when things come, it only lasts a while. And we always think that other people are the ones in like a tribal mindset, but not us. But you know what they're thinking? They're, those other people, I think other people are in the tribal mindset, not them. So it's like, one, how do you know when you're in this, now I have to think of a better way to articulate it, but how do you know when you're in this tribal mindset and what to do and how to, um, yeah, how to stay clear and, and how do you build a root in yourself? And so we'll be talking about that connected to this, uh, yeah, this uh, stronger conference Driscoll situation. But anyway, love, appreciate you guys. Peace and blessing. Let me know your thoughts, um, any questions, comments uh, in the comment section below. Until next time, see you Thursday, next Monday at 8 o'clock. We'll be going through Hebrews chapter 11. Well, without any further ado, peace and blessings. We are out.